Good evening, everybody. It is a pleasure to welcome you to this hybrid event on digital media, art, and conflict, understanding the role of popular visual narratives in the Russo-Ukrainian war. Welcome to our speakers on Zoom, Olha Polishuk, Alina Mozolewska, Svitlana Kot, and Yulia Sodolinska. A warm welcome to our discussant, Lisaveta German, who is here with us at the Diplomatic Academy. And welcome to the students of the DA and to all the participants who are attending the event here and online via streaming. The importance of digital communication in conflicts and wars cannot be overestimated. Digital spaces have proved to be all but just virtual. Along with the escalation of conflicts and wars on battlefields, the possibility to disseminate and share information, images, opinions, and narratives within a few seconds on Instagram, Telegram, YouTube, etc., has proved to be a powerful weapon and to have a great impact on national and international politics. Disinformation and misinformation, the use of algorithms to increase or to limit the exposure of media users to specific contents have become widespread strategies to polarize societies and to destabilize international alliances. On the other hand, digital media offer individuals, activists, artists, spaces to connect and build translocal communities to mobilize solidarity and to call for action. This evening we will focus primarily on this power of digital media on, and art in the context on the Russo-Ukrainian war. And I am particularly grateful to my Ukrainian colleagues who bring a broad range, range of interdisciplinary expertise for helping us understand how digital media and art turn into spaces of political negotiation. Before introducing their work and leaving them the floor, I want to add that this is the first event of a series on culture in diplomacy, diplomacy in culture and society, which will regularly take place here at the Diplomatic Academy with the aim of bringing together different actors interested in discussing about the role played by culture in negotiating inter- and transnational relations. So I'm delighted now to introduce our speakers and our discussant. Dr. Olha Polisuk is an associate professor at the Faculty of Philology at Petro Mohila Black Sea National University in Mykolaiv in Ukraine. She holds a PhD in theory of literature from the same university and collaborates currently with the Center for Border Studies and the chair of North American Literary and Cultural Studies at Saarland University in Germany. In the past two years, she has researched on the topic of borders in crisis, discursive narrative and mediatic border struggles in Ukraine, Europe, and North America, a project for which she received the Volkswagen grant. Dr. Alina Mozolewska is an associate professor at the Faculty of Philology at Petro Mohila Black Sea National University in Mykolaiv. She holds a PhD in linguistics with a major in Romance languages, from um, the National University in Kyiv. Her research interests include media studies, discourse studies, border studies, and political discourse analysis. She was a guest professor and Volkswagen Research Fellow at the Center for Border Studies at Saarland University and non-residential fellow at Prisma Ukraina Research Network Eastern Europe. She's currently a Ukraine-based unit fellow at Centrum für Osteuropa und Internationale Studien in Berlin. Dr. Svitlana Kot is a senior lecturer at Black Sea National University and a research associate in the Department of North Amer American Literary and Cultural Studies at Saarland University in Germany. She holds a PhD in American literature from the Kharkiv National Pedagogical University. Her primary area of expertise is Native American literature, border studies and digital culture studies. In 2022-23, she was a Volkswagen Fellow at Saarland University in the context of the mentioned project Borders in Crisis, Discursive, Narrative and Mediatic Border Struggles in Ukraine, Europe and North America. Dr. Yulia Sodolinska is an Associate Professor at the English Philology Department at Petro Moila Black Sea National University in Mykolaiv 
She holds a PhD in philology from Kherson State University with a major in Germanic languages. Currently, she's a visiting postdoctoral scholar at Saarland University. Her research encompasses cognitive, communicative, and multimodal aspects of various types of discourses in the globalized world. Our discussant, Dr. Lisaveta German, is a curator and an art historian. She is co founder of The Naked Room, a collective of artists based in Kyiv. Lisaveta has co curated the Ukrainian pavilion at the 59th Biennale in Venice which, as you know, counts among the world's largest and most prominent contemporary visual art exhibitions. She is currently a visiting fellow at IWM, Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, and is devoting her fellowship to drafting a book about key episodes of Ukrainian art history from the 60s to the present day. She received a PhD degree in art history at the National Academy of Fine Arts and Architecture in Kyiv, in 2016, she was placed as curator in residence at Liverpool Biennale, supported by the British Council Ukraine. Together with Ola Balashova, she has co-authored a book on the art of Ukrainian 60s and co-edited the volume Decommunized, Ukrainian Soviet Mosaics. Since 2014, Lisaveta Elizabeth has been working with Maria Lanko as a curatorial collective and has organized with her more than 30 exhibitions in Ukraine. I will now leave the floor first to Ola, Alina, Svitlana, and Julia, who will present their research on digital media and art, then to Lisaveta, who will comment and discuss the topic from her perspective as an art historian and as a curator, and then we will open the discussion to the audience. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank um, Julia, for, uh, from all of us for this very nice presentation and thank you for giving uh, this space uh, and providing um, uh, opportunity to discuss uh, some insights uh, of our research. I would like to um, uh, say a few words about the project and then uh, give you the first uh, very short introduction and then my colleagues will continue. Uh, it's a part of uh, our big project, we're collecting data from uh, different sources, um, mostly, mainly we're focused on uh, visual uh, artworks, and um, the first paper was published uh, just recently, and uh, we will be happy to provide you some insights um, uh, of um, our research. Um, as uh, it was nicely said in the introduction, um, it's not possible to talk about contemporary wars without uh, taking into account uh, its digital aspect. Um, digital techno technologies transform the way uh, the wars are fought, uh, but also the way they are experienced and lived um, and then remembered. And it is true to say that uh, the Russo-Ukrainian war is um, uh, the, uh, to present the most documented war in uh, uh, in human history. Um, uh, a lot of information, different kind of content is being constantly shared in real time um, in different uh, um, digital environments, which creates uh, a lot of information available to different users, but also uh, it, it makes uh, uh, war more obscure to some extent. And we are here to uh, make it more clear and understandable. Um, it's also true to say that the uh, Russo-Ukrainian war uh, is very visual. A lot of visual ca content was created since the very first day of the uh, full-scale invasion, and it was very different. There were documentary footages from the front line, from the uh, devastated cities, but also a lot of artwork that uh, uh, served different functions to inform, to document, to narrate, to witness, but also to present artistic interpretation of the events. Um, and... Uh, um, uh, we uh, follow um, the understanding of the contemporary digital, uh, the role of the contemporary digital technologies uh, of Andrew Hoskins, Hoskins, and we see uh, and understand the war now as a digital war, uh, as a, a way to represent uh, uh, and to understand the war that is fought on. Uh, physical background, but also in digital media, uh, which transform the way we understand the the, the, the conflictual e events. Um, 
um, it's also interesting to see uh, how the smartphone changes the way we understand um, uh, and construct the reality of the war. Uh, uh, Russo-Ukrainian war is pe perceived and lived and it's experienced through different apps, uh, platforms, through our telephones, um, uh, which is called by uh, researcher Olga Bychuk, uh, war feed. Uh, through this war feed, we observe different information, including artistic uh, productions, which uh, influences our understanding of the conflict. Um, and to analyze this huge amounts of the data uh, images produce it, produced during the uh, Russo-Ukrainian war, um, we started collecting um, our data for the uh, for the research. Um, uh, to the present, we collected more than uh, 1,000 images uh, from 45 uh, accounts of Ukrainian artists. Um, uh, a lot of images were produced during the first three months of the full-scale invasion, and that's why for now the, our research is limited to this time frame. But we are planning to collect more data and to see how the artistic rep representations develop with the time. And the main approaches that we're using uh, are multimodal discourse analysis that allows to analyze not only the visual content, but also take into consideration uh, the context and uh, verbal elements. And also we use elements of visual analysis to analyze uh, 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 different symbols and uh, visual metaphors presented in um, uh, in visual uh, productions of Ukrainian artists. And I would like to give the floor to uh, the next speaker, Yulia, who will uh, present uh, more uh, in detail uh, the results of our um, uh, research, of our findings. Thank you. Um, the corpus of the digital art uh, that we have analyzed includes a number of artworks relating to the construction and representation of war uh, time reality. And wartime reality is an overarching topic. It encompasses the impact of the war on individuals, on communities, societies. It involves a complex interplay of physical, psychological, economic, social, and political factors that shape the different experiences, circumstances, surroundings, and challenges faced during a period of armed conflict. War turns everyday life that everyone is used to into wartime reality that is full of danger, destruction, and losses. But at the same time, all of this is often met with resilience, hope, and also creativity of the people who have to go through all of this. In this part of today's talk, I will focus on the representation of perception of time, the portrayal of displacement, and the depiction of everyday activities as part of wartime reality uh, that have been portrayed, represented in the digital artworks that we have analyzed, and we'll try to outline the distinctive features. Time is one of the most significant themes in the representation of wartime reality. February 24, the day of the start of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine became a new temporal border for many people in Ukraine and also abroad, because this day has divided their lives into before and after. The analyzed digital art shows how many people woke up from explosions and understood that something that they have feared the most has actually begun. In these artworks, certain images portray Ukrainians who uh, abruptly awakened in, uh, early in the morning and uh, by the explosions that can be visible from their windows. Other images also incorporate different visual motifs featuring alarm clocks, watches with the time of the first bombings. And all this suggests the immediacy of the unfolding event and the first moment that will never be forgotten. Artists constantly return to the topic of the impact of the first days of the full-scale invasion. They try to emphasize the suspension and disruption of time perception, which has been experienced by many Ukrainians due to the war's enormous impact on their lives. To convey this experience, artists used images of a calendar in different variations. And some of the examples we can see here on the screen. Um, some of them featured the date February 24, 2022 on a mostly blank sheet of paper, like we saw on the previous slide, while other artists replaced all other dates with the number 24, uh, like we can see in the third image here. Another set of images represented the world's duration by counting the days on a calendar instead of showing the usual dates. For many, time seemed to freeze on the day when the full-scale invasion began, and their lives turned into a never-ending February where each new day resembled the one before it. 
And even two years later, Ukrainians continue to count. Today is the 742nd day of the full-scale uh, invasion in Ukraine. The present became something that matters here and now, something that has to be documented, something that has to be recorded, shared, and disseminated. Documenting the current state of affairs at a certain point in time is mainly aimed at drawing the world's attention to what is happening in Ukraine. Notably, at the very beginning of the full-scale invasion, artists created images capturing the aftermath of the aggression. They vividly depicted numerous attacks, explosions, and destruction. And this artistic response, largely initiated on February 24, or just a few days later, captures all the horrors and the devastation of the first days, as well as the first emotions and reactions. Despite the somber reality of witnessing the wreckage and the consequences of the awful attacks in daily life, it is very important to capture these moments in digital art, which will later on, well, now and later on, serve as a record of war crimes. And it is also very important to disseminate this information about the true state of affairs in Ukraine. In the analyzed artworks depicting everyday life, the most common are the images of destroyed buildings, missiles and rockets targeted at houses and multi-storied buildings, big holes in houses, ceilings, cracks in windows. These artworks often contain only nonverbal components because in this case, the images speak much louder than words. Uh, when we look at the color palette, we can see that um, it consists of black, gray, and red, and this effectively conveys the extent of devastation. At the same time, we can also see the blue and yellow colors, which signifies the Ukrainian context. Besides that, some of the artists uh, incorporate the silhouettes of individuals within their artworks to symbolize civilian casualties. As we can see in the third image here on the screen, uh, which portrays a tragedy at the Kramatorsk railway station where people who were waiting for evacuation have been killed. Another very significant aspect of the wartime reality narrative is the topic of displacement. With the start of the full-scale invasion, a considerable number of Ukrainians became refugees. They were compelled to leave their homes and to seek safety for their families and above all their children. The digital art that is part of this group contains images of families who leave their war-torn country with only one backpack or a small suitcase. The artworks depict the feelings of many Ukrainians who were forced to leave with only one emergency backpack and had to fit into it the things that meant the most for them. Things that remind them of their homes, their lives before the war. Some of the artworks portray people who are walking towards safety, some driving their cars, Many images in the analyzed data set show evacuation trains that rescue people and take them away from danger. The color palette of the digital art in this thematic group mainly consists of blue, yellow, and white, signifying the path to safety. Some also contain the shades of gray and black, but in many cases, um, this is meant to be suggesting the threats that people are running away from. Uh, one more characteristic feature of this group of artwork is the depiction of pets uh, in many artworks. This is one of the poignant aspects of the Ukra experience of Ukrainian refugees, because many of them took their pets with them instead of leaving them behind. Besides the representation of the awful destruction of the water in cities, they're all, the author, artists also focus on the depiction of routine activities and rituals. How are you is not a routine question for Ukrainians anymore. These three words in English, two words in Ukrainian, yakti, became important and they're used throughout the days, throughout the night, especially after they have been used that in one of the cities, uh, one of the cities has been bombed. And the answer to this question is one of the most awaited ones. This has become a new wartime password for Ukrainians. Another activity is a practice that became a daily ritual for many Ukrainians is reading the news. During war, most Ukrainians often start their day by reading the news on their mobile devices. And then they check the news throughout the day to keep up with the unfolding events and to know what is going on. The newly acquired habit of not switching on the lights in order not to be a target of the enemy becomes one more symbol of solidarity, mutual support, and care. Uh, the image on the last slide depicts, uh, on the last picture, dark houses with yellow lights in the shape of hearts inside, which symbolizes the lights that the people bring to each other's lives. Many everyday activities shift significantly during wartime. Deviating from the usual norms, no matter where Ukrainians are located, they aim to make their contributions to Ukraine's victory. Some of the images depict different ways of helping the Ukrainian army, which include donating blood, making camouflage nets, raising money, 
collecting things which are necessary for the army. And although many of the images representing um, the wartime reality represent harsh wartime experience of the present, there is also space for envisioning the peaceful future. A significant number of the analyzed artworks express the idea of rebuilding Ukraine and being able to have the peaceful everyday life that people are used to. Such visuals often include the verbal components, which have um, verb, which have verbs in the future tense, but they also have the images, <laughs> sorry, uh, which shows the activities that the Ukrainians will be doing once uh, victory is achieved. The darker colors, mainly shades of gray and black, tend to dominate in the representations of the present, whereas brighter and more vivid colors are used for images of the future. And interestingly, the analyzed artworks mainly present the events of the present and the future, and only a few of them represent the events from the past. Despite the transformation of everyday reality into a distressing wartime experience, where survival often prevent, prevails over living life, Ukrainians' resilience and desire to live and move forward remains unyielding. Overall, the wartime reality narrative encompasses a rather numerous group of artworks in the digital art that appeared within the initial three months of the full-scale invasion. The artists did their best to provoke global awareness of the events unfolding in Ukraine. They tried to seek support and promote options to help the country and its people. Moreover, these artists intended for their work to be uh, vivid, to be seen. They wanted to emphasize the enduring resilience of Ukrainians who persist in their daily lives and endeavors despite the great adversities they faced, all in pursuit of Ukraine's uh, victory. And they also wanted to express the gratitude to the world for the support and for standing with Ukraine. And I'm passing the floor to my colleague, Olga, uh, who will tell about the victims. So, one of the tasks of art is to reflect reality in all its manifestations. All the traumatic events trigger the most intense artistic expression. Uh, digital art also responds uh, quickly to this problem and visualize all the terrible consequences of the Russian occupation of Ukraine cities, uh, Ukrainian cities and villages. Women and children are the most vulnerable category of society in an armored conflict. The symbolism of female victimhood is uh, further contextualized with the use of Ukrainian national symbols, trident, national flag, sunflower, or the traditional national colors of Ukraine, blue and yellow. The connection between images of suffering, stereotypical victim portrayals, and emblematic Ukrainian national representations helps to build the links between Ukrainian war experience and the larger cultural and media space. The brutality of violence and sexual abuse during the war are often expressed through the depiction of fragile young women's bodies combined with such symbols of violence as black and red colors. The act of sexual abuse of women and girls is perhaps the most painful narrative of the Russo-Ukrainian war that artists reflect upon. The pain of Ukrainian women and girls suffering from such violence is visualized in digital art through the depiction of nudity and the defenselessness of the victim. And this is combined with the expression of a wide palette of negative emotions from apathy to rage. Often, digital illustrations are based on the real war crimes of the Russo Ukrainian war. For example, a well-known photo of the hand of Irina Folkina, who was killed in Bucha by Russian soldiers, was visualized in the artwork of Olga Art. Uh, she depicted a blue rose that seems to rise from the palm of the murdered woman. Intextual connection can be traced with the rock blue rose by the Ukrainian writer Lesya Ukrayunka. This blue flower is a symbol of internal love. In the example, it embodies the symbolic meaning of internal love for life, which was presently captured by the Russian occupiers. 
In some artworks, the images of women and children are fused and express the collective suffering of civilians during wartime. The image of the mother caring and protecting their children affected by the war is central to the imagery of Ukrainian art productions, and such imaginary has gradually acquired a symbolic, almost sacred meaning. During the first months of the war, several images of wounded or psychological devastated young mother breastfeeding their babies in bomb shelters or the subway went viral. Naturally, the artists were inspired by those powerful images. For example, Anta Arf threw upon the traditional image of a mother and depicted her as the Madonna with a halo around her head. The biblical motif elevates the Ukrainian mother to the rank of uh, saint. For example, Marinos art uses the image of a mother in her works, combining a real life person and biblical imagery. A halo with a subway map adds modernity to this biblical image of a mother. And Svetlana, please. Yeah, and I would like to continue. Uh, and uh, speak more about the heroic narratives and actually not only the heroic narratives, but also the anti-hero narratives, which are closely connected to the victimhood narratives. So if I, um, if you let me start, I would uh, start with the fact that this hero and anti-hero narratives are or can be um, named as the most essential narratives of the warfare because they um, symbolically uh well, not only symbolically, but in um, through these visual narratives, they simplify the complexity of war while also drawing a very distinct line between us and them. And I would uh, probably start with the, um, um, yeah, with the narratives that are devoted to the other, to depicting of the other or depicting of the enemy. So depicting of the enemy is uh, quite a complex process that involves a combination of storytelling, propaganda, and also some psychological uh, strategies. And they are usually a response to the existential threat that uh, the enemy, uh, the Russian aggression is representing um, to Ukraine and to the people of Ukraine, which artists uh, try to capture and depict. And um, well, among the main strategies that are used uh, in such narratives, in the narratives depicting the other, are the strategy of demonizing, dehumanizing uh, of the other. Then there is also um, some uh, satirical um, narratives that are uh, circulating and go viral. And also um, uh, there is a lot of symbolism. Usually the symbolism is represented through black and red uh, and the symbolism of blood and uh, the symbolism of destruction that I'm going to talk about. Well, uh, the first strategy that you can uh, see as depicted in this um, I would call them digital artifacts, we can see the demonizing of the other. So um, very often, uh, many political, prominent, iconic figure of the Russian Federation, uh, as well as uh, like random soldiers are depicted as demons, as imps, as uh, various hellish um, as various um, hellish images connected with hell that, um, uh, well, that conveys the symbolism of uh, hell and evil that are applied to uh, them. And all, uh, also connecting with the image of the death and destruction that uh, the enemy brings. Um, among other dehumanizing strategy, we can see that very often the artists capture and try to portray the war crimes uh, committed by um, Russian soldiers on the Ukrainian land. Mainly, they depict the looting and uh, the rape and, well, uh, murders and tortures that are being, um, well, that are being told about uh, on the media um, as well. But artists try to present them in a more dramatic, obviously more dramatic way. Um, the next um, 
strategy that we can see is also um, using um, uh, the allegorical depiction of ab abhorrence and disgust. So um, very often everything Russian is depicted as uh, something very disgusting. Definitely that uh, evokes also uh, some sort of um, 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 abhorrence and uh, that uh, is actually um, very connected with the physiological reaction of a person. So if we feel um, something is so disgusting, we definitely would try to distract from it. And obviously we can see all these images of um, dead bodies or um, burned uh, destroyed, uh, which not only evoke, evoke this abhorrence, but also demonstrate the desire to um, the total annihilation of the enemy. Uh, we can very often see that through this animalistic images, because quite often this Russian bear, that is a quite symbolical representation of Russia, or this two-headed eagle, which is um, uh, the symbol of the Russian Federation very often is depicted as this totally destructed, annihilated, and the Russian soldiers are also very often depicted not as real people, but mainly as the remnants of the people which do not um, sort of do not have any similarities with real people, which is also sort of the dehumanizing strategy. And we can also see the um, Russian worship, a very famous Russian worship, which is also being distracted. And this is the Russian worship Moscow. And um, that leads us to um, the next strategy that is very often used um, within this visual uh, narratives on Instagram. And uh, we all know this famous um, saying uh, that was said by um, a guard from the from Zmini Island on the first day of the um, uh, full-scale Russian invasion, where uh, he refused to surrender to the Russian warship Moscow, which offered them to surrender. And the border guard just uh, told the uh, Russian warship, uh, well, to go F itself and then the Russian worship was distracted. This phrase, as well as many other obscene language, is uh, highly uh, and very often used within the images, which actually demonstrate a sign of resilience and also the lack of fear to the enemy. Um, and um, it, uh, it is very often used uh, through and within the satirical and humiliating images, which um, depict also very often not only Russian soldiers, but some political leaders of the Russian Federation and uh, Russian allies. Um, and very often such pictures, they are mainly um, political cartoons. They uh, show and depict uh, the bottoms, the genitals, the lower parts of the body, and uh, definitely they evoke or they tend to uh, mm, create some humiliation and again the uh, lack of fear towards the enemy in that sense. Um, Obviously, uh, the Russian leader, the president of Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, is among, or I would say, the, uh, his um, um, well, his image is dominating the whole landscape of the anti-hero narrative because uh, the image of this person is very often depicted. And you, we can we can see all the strategies, both demonizing, dehumanizing, and satirical uh, uh, rhetoric around this figure. Um, you can actually see uh, the illustration of that in all these pictures. But uh, what what is often uh, or quite often seen is that um, uh, artists draw parallels between this political figure and other dictators throughout history, mainly Stalin or Hitler, um, 
using in such a way the symbolic capital of the of this uh, very iconic historical figures which um help to draw parallels between the totalitarian regimes and the um well the um, the deeds right that they are they were doing um very often the key symbol in um uh, depicting uh, Vladimir Putin and as well as Russian soldiers, but with Vladimir Putin, is uh, this is um, a more often case is this uh, symbolism of blood because Putin is very often depicted as uh, with his hands in blood, with like having a bath in blood, uh, which obviously has much connection with blaming him for the bloody word that uh, he is causing and uh, uh in other uh, well um another strategy is as i said we can see a uh, multiple representation of the humiliating pictures of the russian leader um which target very often his masculinity which actually try well this is the strategy which evokes the idea of uh, a certain impotence and the inability to win the war, which is obviously a desire of the Ukrainian artists. Um, and uh, also very often artists in their th or through their art uh, blame Russian people and Russian culture for not only for not resisting the war, as you can, for example, see in the first picture where Russians are blamed for, um, uh, well, listening to uh, Russian propaganda and uh, believing it, while also we can see the iconic uh, historical and cultural figures. Uh, from the Russian Federation, such as um, artists, writers, uh, musicians, who, among others, obviously a lot of them are dead, but this is to um, symbolically underline the fact or emphasize the fact that the Russian culture is also responsible for, um, for spreading the Russian narratives within Russia and outside. And at this point, I would like to uh, move to the depicting of the self or depicting of uh, heroism um, on digital or uh, on Instagram. Um, as I said, heroic narratives is um, an epitome of the war because they uh, legitimize the uh, desired behavior and also they um, honor valor, they honor bravery, and they demonstrate the um, they, they demonstrate the features that are expected from the people within country. Um, very often, but not not that often, I would say, uh, Ukrainian prominent political figures are uh, depicted uh, within this narratives, and we can see Russian president and the military leaders. However, they are very often, and this is uh, what we've noticed, that very often those pictures, um, they are connected either with the uh, the images of Ukrainian population uh, per se, or uh, they are... Uh, depicted as certain superheroes, uh, which um, uh, shows that uh, popular culture is an important source in um, creating, for, for artists, uh, to create such images, which we can see certain um, parallels and also intertextuality with the modern popular culture, while also we can understand that um, this is made to uh, uh, again, to uh, draw a certain line between what is good and what is bad, what is uh, like the desired, yeah, what is heroic and what is not. And obviously the superheroes, which are good and which are always fighting uh, evil, they are depicted as having superpowers to to fight and to win. Um 
among other sources for Ukrainian heroic narratives is uh, various uh, various iconic figures, iconic Ukrainian historic figures, uh, such as, for example, Cossacks, who were uh, very prominent warriors, or Stepan Bandera, for example, who is uh, who is also among Ukrainian iconic national figures. Or uh, you can see here, uh, for example, a Ukrainian artist, Maria, Maria Primachenko, whose museum was destroyed by Russians during their uh, well, if within the first somewhere with the first days of the Russian aggression, and we can see how she strikes back at in this picture. However, what we can also uh, see is that um, during the war time, we can see the creation of a new war mythology in Ukraine because what we can see here is the depiction of the hero. Uh, well, a very iconic war hero in Ukraine, uh, whose uh, sort of nickname is the Ghost of Kiev. Actually, the this is um, uh, this is believed to be not a real picture of uh, not a real person, or at least nobody really knows who this person might have been. But this per this uh, pilot is believed to destroy a lot of. Um, uh, Russian uh, aircrafts in air-to-air -air battle. However, the whole idea of the ghost of Kiev was actually not like the idea, but the the, the uh, image, right, or the um, uh, the legend of the war of Kiev was actually or, or originated through digital me media within the three tweets like this this legend appeared on twitter first and then got viral and got circulated and so far nobody really knows whether it is a mystification or not but what we can obviously see that digital um digital spaces is the new ground for creating a new mythology and new uh a new mythology a heroic mythology for ukraine um and if I go on, what we also can see is that if we are talking about the heroic narratives, we can see that artists are trying to narrate resilience and resistance. Uh, and this resilience and resistance is narrated through depicting real ordinary people uh, fighting not only at the battlefield, which where soldiers or warriors are fighting, but in their everyday life, fighting the Russian aggression with every means possible, whether it's um, the electricians, for example, who were um, who were fixing the electrical lines while Russia targeted uh, the electric station and the uh, infrastructure or people who were trying to oppose Russian tanks bare hand or like people are uh, doing their jobs every day, we can also see a certain diversity of Ukrainian people who all have the main aim to, um, well, to be resilient and to fight back the Russian aggression. And these images are much more frequent than, for example, the images of soldiers. And this is a very interesting fact that the images of soldiers are not that uh, frequent. However, when they are depicted, they're not depicted as um, like fighting at the battlefield. And it's uh, almost never they are, they are depicted fighting. Mainly they are depicted either, for example, as people, for example, there is a series of um, the pictures depicting soldiers in their, uh, as doing their jobs that they were doing before the war, demonstrating that the soldiers are ordinary Ukrainians who were not recruited, but who were um, who, who uh, decided to go to the battlefield to fight the Russian aggression, who are just ordinary Ukrainians uh, in their everyday life. Uh, also, very often soldiers are depicted uh, together with their families, with their loved ones, with their children, and with uh, very often with pets, which also demonstrate only the human side, silencing uh, the violence that these people have to endure at the battlefield, but demonstrating the human side of the soldiers, and also demonstrating their vulnerability, as you can see in the middle picture, um, where uh, this picture actually depicts the traumatic experience that 
uh, the soldiers endure during their service. And uh, now I would give the floor to my colleague who will continue speaking about regendering of the heroic narratives. Uh, thank you. Modern digital popular culture not only amplifies visibil the visibility of female combatants, but also assigns to femininity in new meanings and uh, ideologies. In contrast uh, to male combatant figures, which are depicted in a way that can highlight peaceful and uh, nonviolent predisposition, female images featuring heroic rhetoric are depicted as more violent, uh, signaling a much stronger determination to fight, which is expressed with body language and uh, facial expression. A recurring uh, symbol of women protection images is uh, embodied in the swords and uh, shields, as well as in the images of children and babies, which that some female characters shield whilst carrying a weapon in their hands. Also, artists often illustrate how women can simultaneously fulfill several important social roles in times of war. For example, here is a picture depicting a female angel wearing a Ukrainian armed force uniform, holding a sword in one hand and a scale in the other, which is a reference to St. Michael. This image combines biblical, social, legal, uh, legal and civil symbols. Uh, this combination reveals, first of all, the inner strength of a woman who is forced to defend her children and family with weapons in her hands. Women are often depicted as active participants who lead battles side by side with men. In this case, the image of a Ukrainian woman warrior also confronts the enemy, and in many illustrations, she is um, endowed with the extraordinary strength, not only internal, but also physical. For example, the artist uh, Nevan Maid created a number of such posters uh, dedicated to women in war. Among them, it is worth highlighting a poster of a female soldier bending the turret of a Russian tank with her bare hands. The woman has an infinity sign above her head and is larger than the tank, indicating her spiritual superiority over the enemy, as well as the infinity of justice on earth. Um, certain images allude to the figure of the Virgin Mary with baby Jesus or a transformed uh, Virgin Mary Oranta, a revealed symbol of Ukrainian defense against uh, adversity. We see that the depiction of Oranta in the new digital and cultural realms is being transformed into more uh, heroic and more active since her arms are now raised higher, symbolizing instead of a prayer uh, the heroic uh, triumphant uh, gesture, which together with the weapon in the arm symbolize uh, readiness for combat and active protection. Which, um, a witch, an image of a woman who defeats the enemy with a spell, a son, a look, etc., is another female culture hero that can become immensely popular in times of war. Among images of witches, the Conotop witch is the most famous artic, uh, artistic image that emerged during the occupation of Conotop, Sumer region, by the Russian military forces. The intertextuality of this image dates back to 1837, when the Ukrainian writer Grigory Kvitkasnovyaninka published a novel with the same name. The modernized image of a witch in the context of the Russo-Ukrainian war, where Ukrainian woman, women can defeat her enemies uh, with the power of words alone, is a recurrent symbol for many illustrators. This image has become a new symbol of resistance to Russian armed aggression. 
Moreover, there are images of Ukrainian women in traditional national costumes carrying weapons. As an example, in a drawing by Anta Arf, uh, a woman face is serious and hostline, and she has nine cybers behind her back. The intertextuality of the image of uh, cybers refers to the nine of uh, swords uh, tarot card. Uh, the artist changes the swords to uh, sabers in her work to emphasize Ukrainianness. The author's comment accompanying the um, artwork refers to the fact that there will be losses not only in Ukrainian society, but primarily among their enemies. A similar motif is developed by Marina's art depicted a woman in Ukrainian national costume with a pitchfork and homemade incendiary mixtures behind her back. The woman holds a bloody bear's head in her hands, which directly indicates the defeat of the Russian military. Ukrainian artists use this symbol very effectively in their representations of the Russo-Ukrainian war. One piece shows a young woman has with sunflowers behind her back, which has also become a new symbol in this war. The sunflower is one of the traditional floral symbols of Ukraine, which has the meaning of um, fertility and life. However, with the beginning of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the symbolic meaning of this flower has transformed due to the real story of a woman from Henichis, Kherson region. When Russian troops invade the town on 24th February 2022, a Ukrainian woman approached an armed Russian soldier and said, I quote, Did you come to our land? Why the fuck did you come? You came to our land put seeds in your pockets so that when you are killed, sunflowers will sprout." End of quote. The video of this incident quickly went viral and artists began to actively use their sunflower in their work as a symbol of victory and the continuation of life in Ukraine after um, the defeat of the Russian occupiers. Uh, visual Representations um, of women are created to symbolize the everyday bravery of people which take their form um, of uh, selfless acts of support to each other in times of need, uh, diligent dedication to one's professional duties and heroic attempts to fight the invaders which one uh, bear hands or the tools uh, one has at, uh, at one's uh, disposal, even if it is a simple jar of uh, pickles. The latter is a perfect example of a wartime moral boosting war anecdote uh, that swiftly grew viral. This story is based on an incident in which a Ukrainian woman successfully brought, brought down a drone using only a jar of pickles. The images of a jar of pickles accompanied by slogans and captions emphasize themes of indomitable resilience and the ongoing struggle for liberation. Um, and Alina, can you continue? Yeah, well, slightly out of time, I will really briefly make the conclusion. Um, as we could see, uh, digital art uh, can not only help to co-create the social reality, to cope with the new uh, experiences of the wartime, but also create very powerful narratives uh, that unite, uh, help to uh, build connections within society and um, uh, promote resilience and resistance of uh, uh, Ukrainians. And um, one of the main functions that we've noticed while we were analyzing uh, digital artworks, that uh, they are very powerful tool to construct the unity within the society, but also uh, to mobilize uh, uh, population on national and international level. A lot of examples that you could see uh, throughout the presentation, they serve to uh, provide shared experiences of the war, uh, live together uh, some uh, harshness of, of the wartime, uh, but also create very victorious histories uh, of the resistance, as we could see with Azmini Island or with uh, civilian resistance. All these images widely shared and remediated online 
uh, um, help to uh, um, uh, mobilize the society and uh, make believe in the, the victory and the success. But also we have other examples. Um, as you see, a lot of images, uh, they are not created only for Ukrainians. They, a lot of images are created also in uh, um, using English language and they are directed to the international audience. Um, artists were very active in, ta uh, in tagging uh, different organizations and politicians and uh, uh, public public uh, figures uh, to, uh, in order to attract attention to uh, uh, the Russo-Ukrainian war, to make Ukraine vo more visible. Indeed, uh, during the first three months of the war, uh, uh, digital works were used as a weapon to mobilize society within Ukraine, to mobilize uh, different actors uh, outside Ukraine to make Ukrainian narrative more visible and to construct the image of the self uh, in some way to reconstruct, to rebuild the self, uh, because a lot of uh, new stories of heroism and resistance were added into the national narrative. And a lot of net floor stories that you could see were uh, co-constructed and co-created together with artists. Uh, but also it was a powerful tool to attract attention from outside which can be easily illustrated with the uh, hashtags that were used uh, during uh, the first three months of the war. One of the main uh, hashtag was stand with Ukraine, close the sky, stop Russia, uh, stop war, stop Putin. All these hashtags were actively used by artists to uh, attract attention to uh, what is happening in Ukraine uh, and to fight the aggressor. And within the time, artistic practices uh, even uh, became more elaborated and we see a lot of projects uh, that are now uh, taking place in Ukraine and outside Ukraine in digital media uh, or in traditional spaces. And I'm sure that our discussant will add a few more examples to this. Um, thank you very much for your attention uh, and we'll be happy to answer your questions. First of all, thank you so much for this amazing outstanding research. Um, I have like lots of comments and feedback uh, to share with you uh, and I just applause to your um, tremendous efforts to put all this information together because you know for me as someone who who considers herself as a part of the audience of these images I mean I myself was following all these Instagram channels and saw all these images and for me this is it used to be more a part of my like everyday living experience rather my point of research or a scientific interest. It, it was a part of my everyday life, basically. And uh, therefore, it is like, for me, it's, it's twice interesting and even more in intensely interesting to, you know, to see how, how, how you guys just put it together and analyzed it and made such a brilliant conclusion. So I will comment on it. But first of all, I want to show just a couple of... Um, a small part of many, many more examples which could be part of this presentation, but I would like to just um, give you a couple of other um, examples or cases uh, on how artists um, act in the social media, how artists reflect and comment uh, on the ongoing events of the, of the full-scale invasion. And I would like to start with a screenshot. I will translate it. It's in... Um, um, it's in Ukrainian. Uh, it's written by an art historian and a museum worker, Anna Aliyeva, a colleague of mine. Uh, it was posted just actually several days ago after a devastating stroke of Shahed, of this flying drone which killed um, 11 people, including five children, in, in Odessa. And um, yeah, she made a post saying, like, I'm mourning with Odessa. Um, uh, but why, why uh, on the next day the, the internet uh, was uh, flooded, uh, was trashed uh, with this horrible art um, dedicated to this um, endless uh, grief of um, Odessa people. Uh, why don't you guys, um, she's addressing artists, uh, can hold yourself and not draw, not create anything and share this uh, endless, tasteless, content. Uh, if you cannot, if you, um, how do I say, if you can resist and not 
make art, better not make art. Uh, so it, just in a nutshell, yeah, basically she says that, yeah, she, 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 she kind of um, comments on the um, inappropriate um, uh, amount, inappropriate volume of artistic comments, digital art comments on, on the very, you know, deep mourning of a deep, very deep grief which, uh, grief which touched uh, uh, the whole country. And I must say that things like, like this Odessa um, catastrophe, you know, it, it happens unfortunately, almost on a weekly basis, but every new, every new occasion, every new, you know, um, casualties, they actually, you know, as, as touching as they were two years ago. So, you know, you cannot really get used to it. You cannot, you know, uh, become, um, you cannot kill your senses. You're still very much, you know, influenced by, um, by this news. But nevertheless, and it's interesting, but then there is a comment of the, another, person who is very famous in Odessa. He's not, he's, he's, he's not an artist himself, but he's very close to artistic community. Everyone knows him, Dmitry Sikorsky, and he actually, he comments that, don't look at it uh, as an art professional. Look at it as a, a certain way of uh, art therapy, a certain, yeah, kind of uh, healing, um, basically healing, um, um, action. So this dialogue, like very random dialogue in the Facebook basically, is, uh, is very, um, I think, illustrative um, on how um, more and more art professionals like art historians, curators, other artists become slightly critical towards the, the digital art through this kind of um, um, viral artistic activity in the social media and just try to analyze a little bit what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, you know, what, to which extent artists and art creators can actually, you know, um, dig deep into very uh, sensitive topics. And this is a good discussion, I think it's a very separate discussion, but um, uh, the reason why I picked up uh, this particular case is that I think um, um, what the ladies did and I think it's extremely important they, um, because their research is, um, is, uh, doesn't cover all the, the two years of, of the full-scale war, but only, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the first four months since February till March 2022, which was a very different period than we are experiencing now, because the, the mood of the society is different. I mean, the circumstances are different. And I think the first four months uh, of, of, of war were the most devastating, people were lost, people were shocked. This is an experience you cannot you know, prepare yourself to. But at the same time, this was the moment, I think, of the highest enthusiasm and the highest belief, almost in this kind of eschatological sense, almost in this you know, kind of biblical sense, the hope and belief irrational, you know, in the victory, uh, irrational belief in that it will, will everything will stop soon, it will, it will, like Ukraine will win, will win soon. And, Unfortunately, this is not the case as we know now after the two years of war and this kind of level, and I don't want to sound unpatriotic, you know, but this level of hope in society, of course, is different now. It's much lower because now people are more realistic and see that it's not that easy. But um, uh, in this light, I think what, what, what my colleagues did, they actually um, um, analyzed and um, kind of uh, highlighted this very unique moment in not just in Ukrainian visual art history, but maybe in the, you know, world art history of the present moment, contemporary art history, is that actually when, when the, the art, uh, the artistic reflection was um, immediate, when the artistic reflection was almost not um, disconnected in no way from the real life, like the art was actually reflecting the real emotions and the the the, uh, the rapidness um, uh, of the reaction of the artistic reaction towards the daily events was almost as fast as the online streaming. You know, there was no distance between the what was happening, what was discussed, what was felt by people, and the um, huge amount of artistic reactions and artistic documentation of, of, of this moment. So I think it is very also um, important to kind of get back to these memories, get back to these archives, which can now serve even us Ukrainians, a very powerful source of inspiration. Also every time, you know, we, the Ukrainians or the international audience who is let's be honest, tired of the Ukrainian agenda, uh, or at least not that much enthusiastic as um, it was two years ago or even one year ago, I think we have to remind oneself and kind of 
take this example of this endless enthusiasm, endless belief, and endless bravery, um, and kind of remind ourselves that the war is still as as much intense as it was two years ago, and we still have to, you know, kind of, you know, find this grip and um, um, carry on. And in this light, art can be a real powerful source of inspiration. So it's not like if, you know, if two years ago uh, or like a year and a half ago, life and emotions and reflections of people were inspiration source for artists, now I think art can be, can bring us back this inspiration and remind ourselves us Ukrainians, but also international audience, that there is still hope and there is still, you know, um, kind of light and, um, and yeah, and love and uh, um, um, solidarity and all these things that actually keep the Ukrainian society, you know, alive in um, not only physically but also mentally. Um, yeah, so just a couple of, of examples before I jump back to my um, practical comments to the presentation. Just several examples of how artists actually act um, in social media. Um, I would, you know, present more practical examples. It's not r artistic reflections, it's not artworks, it's not illustrations, but it's a very uh, concrete strategies of uh, fundraising. Because what artists are doing now, not all of them, but many, many of them, they actually um, look for some creative tools, for some interest in imagery or some linguistic um, linguistic constructions and some, I don't know, social media tricks um, to basically attract their audiences to donate money. And I must say the audiences of Ukrainian artists are not, you know, big fundraising, uh, fundraising, um, um, I don't know, um, to, not to big donors, not to big companies, but actually they address their peers and their friends, you know, people who don't have a uh, big income but still are willing to donate. And now what is happening now in Ukrainian social media, I would call it like a competition uh, of, create, uh, of yeah, creative competition for the most witty and effective fundraising, um, fundraising campaign. For example, uh, this guy, the artist Bogdan Bunchak, who's also the war veteran, he, was, he, he went as a volunteer to serve and he was heavily wounded. Luckily, he, he, he survived and now, I mean, now he, he has some um, kind of trauma, but he, he's, yeah, he, he won't be back, he won't go back to army because of his wounds, but uh, he can be artist again or fundraiser. Yeah, and he just, you know, kind of using this uh, internet uh, funky imagery, emojis, this kind of a little bit of a teenager's um, language to, to make it, uh, to make his donation, his fundraising campaign visible. Um, uh, also, a very uh, popular tool for artists is donate their works, their actual physical works, and to make uh, lotteries, to make uh, um, uh, like auctions, online auctions, you know, who, you know, you can donate as little as, I don't know, five euros and then just take part in this competition and uh, uh, like real people actually um, win real artworks and start collecting art. So it's also a kind of funny, witty comment on the Ukrainian art market, which is not there, uh, which is not, uh, well, basically, you know, galleries doesn't sell that much art as they did before the war, obviously, but um, as a replacement for that, there is this new sort of fundraising, donating art market where you're not buying art, but, but you donate every day, and, you know, if you donate every day, maybe once in a month you can win something, which is funny and easy and cheerful, and artists are eagerly actually producing works and, you know, donating works. Um, yeah, but, but also some of the artists who, who are very present and visible in the social media, for example, Masha Ryeva, she's, um, she has like a um, huge number of followers, she, she's, um, you know, she collaborates with fashion magazines, so her audience goes beyond just art people, but also cover media and fashion and, I don't know, lifestyle audience, something like this. Um, she just organizes this uh, yeah, campaign with this quite fashionable image. Which I also think interesting, which is interesting because uh, through this sort of, you know, through this sort of imagery, through this sort of language the artists use, and they're also, you know, presenting the everyday life in wartime Ukraine, not just as a, you know, gloomy and uh, complicated, and, w uh, but which is actually this way because, you know, the country is still at war and it's not, it's not the, you know, the most cheerful place to live your life, but still, you know, they want kind of present this alternative alternative version, um, and um, 
you know, kind of make a statement you, that you can still be creative, you can still be stylish, you can still, you know, be funky, even if you, you know, live under the constant shelling and, uh, yeah, in danger of being um, um, invaded. Um, then, like, another strategy is reporting. Uh, Nikita Kadan, whose images I present, he is actually one of the most um, famous Ukrainian contemporary artists internationally. I mean, his works are now, you know, presented in all the biggest museums and art exhibitions and art fairs, so he's like a real superstar. Um, and uh, uh, because of that, he has um, he has a bil um, possibility to travel. Because as you might know, a um, uh, man of between 18 and 60 years cannot leave the country because of the military service obligations. But uh, um, he is a, let's say, famous artist, can sometimes get a special permission to travel for some art exhibition, for some conference, you know, to do... Uh, cultural diplomacy mission, um, and um, uh, what is interesting is that actually he made a deliberate choice to stay in Ukraine, to not leave the country, to not flee the country, to not kind of abuse this per temporary permissions because he could, you know, travel and stay abroad, um, but he never did it. He, he stays in Kiev in his uh, hometown, and what he's doing, he reports. He basically takes this very realistic, sometimes gloomy, unpretty images of what surrounds him, and in this way he just informs his international audience, which consists of, you know, celebrated curators, art collectors, like museum directors, so very kind of, of the establishment of the international art world. And what he's doing, he's not, you know, he's not presenting just images of his artworks, but actually he reports, he, he says, look, this is where I live, you know, this is what I see every day, this is my background, which I found quite honest and interesting. Yeah, just another example of, yeah, of um, uh, donating fundraising campaigns. Um, this is uh, Stas Torin and Bogdan Bunchak, the one I mentioned before who was serving in the army. The second one um, is one of the most active just fundraisers. I don't know if he's doing anything else. I think just like I see everyday activity. And he's not, the, he's a very introvert person. He's not this sort of, you know, person who, who, is, who easily communicates and who easily, you know, gathers people around him. So I think for him is a personal challenge to do these kind of things. But uh, he just draws every day. He, he posts his drawings and, and sell them for as little as, I don't know, like 10 euros or 15 euros, which is a small money even for Ukrainian audience. And he just, you know, do it and do it and do it and sell it to his friends who doesn't have much, who doesn't have more than this 15 euros, but you know, he kind of um, um, still um, yeah, makes a lot of money and donates it and reports about his donations. Um, but then the very same, I will quickly jump back a little bit, but then the very same person, uh, Stas, uh, um, he's with, with the mic here, um, he's given a speech next to Olena Zelenska, the first lady of Ukraine, so um, uh, in the same like panel discussion or the, o the opening of the exhibition, so it's also interesting how, you know, how our artists who consider th themselves quite marginal ones, um, they suddenly become very visible because of their everyday hard work of donating fundraising and just, you know, doing their social service when one cannot do the military service because Stanislav, because of his health conditions, he can't do the military service um, uh, because if he wouldn't have it, I'm sure he would, would, he would go to the army. I will jump back. Um, yeah, but definitely what our artists also do, they, they document and um, uh, uh, my colleagues were presenting mostly the works of... Um, of the artist who, who, whose um, main occupation is illustration, graphic design uh, of digital creators. But what is interesting is that uh, basically this division, this, this, this line between different genres and different formats of artistic expression, which were quite visible before the war, um, like, for example, we know that there is, there is visual art, there is museum art, and then there is illustration, so graphic design, which you know, just, you know, exhibited, which are normally exhibited in specialized exhibitions. But now, basically, all the artists, despite the genre or the format or the trend they're working in, they, you know, work in the same, in the same sphere, and the, the Instagram become, like, a very open and um, agilitarian and uh, horizontal um, platform or exhibition space for all of them. So, uh, what is interesting is that, yeah, the, 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 the topic of, of war and the, the, the urge, the necessity to, to speak about the war through artistic means basically make the artistic field very democratic, where 
all the artists, no matter how um, how famous they are, what genre they work in, are they exhibited in museums, or maybe the Instagram is the only place they can post their art, how famous they are, doesn't matter. They are all, you know, equal in the way they, you know, kind of speak to their audience and uh, um, present their art. Um, there is also an interesting strategy. There are many, many examples I will show, just only a couple of them, where artists actually draw or create an image based on the documentary image. Basically, you know, reproduce the documentary image and create the original artwork. Like in this, this case, I think this is the photograph of the evacuation of people in Kharkiv on the Kharkiv railway station in one of the first days of war. Actually, interesting that the author of this photograph is unknown because I was researching this image for, for another occasion and I didn't find it. I mean, it's, it's like it, it, it became viral, it was reproduced everywhere, but I think it was just a random image by a person who just took it with the, with the camera phone. Um, then this is an image of people hiding under the bridge uh, next to Kyiv. Uh, also in the first days of war, and this image also went viral, and the, the artist from Kherson, who, was not, uh, who wasn't a witness of this event, who also just saw this image on, 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 on in, in internet, like recreated this. I find it quite interesting, you know, how the, yeah, how the artists create this kind of double documentation, as if the photograph image is not enough, is not enough as if you need to, with your art, you need to commemorate not just the event, but to commemorate the very fact that this event was documented. So basically this drawing for me is not a commemoration of the actual event, of the actual episode where people were hiding under the bridge, but it's a commemoration of the image, of the bravery of the photographer who did this image and thus presented to the world the truth about the war and that this kind of act of bravery of photographer deserves some recognition. And this is the visual artist who kind of creates this, who, this kind of, um, yeah, um, I don't know, uh, like memorial or um, like praising the photographer through documenting his his own documentation. Um, yeah, this is the, the the one the empty walls of the one of the Kiev museums, and these are artists who basically helped to clean and reconstruct the museum. This is the museum of uh, one of the prominent Ukrainian museums in Kiev, Hanenko Museum, which hosts a brilliant collection of. Um, European classical art, but also um, uh, Oriental art. And uh, uh, it was one of the few cases where the, the missile rocket hit the city center of Kyiv. And uh, the museum was located next to the place where rocket was, was yeah, fell down. And uh, um, luckily no one got killed and luckily the building itself stayed, stay, stayed, stayed safe, but uh, all the glasses and the glass roof was of course broken and uh, um, many artists just volunteered and went there to help to, yeah, to clean and uh, um, it was of course all documented and posted on Instagram and through seeing these images many people wanted to volunteer and to come to help and uh, um, this was a very also touching act of, of solidarity. Um, yeah, I will maybe skip some of the images and just go to my like final final point is uh, um, because we are now discussing today we're discussing of course the digital presence of art the digital art but I also wanted to make a small bridge to the offline world of art in Ukraine and uh, uh, just present two strategies of exhibiting art offline. Um, and I would show two contrast examples, two very different examples. The first one is the exhibition uh, curated by, uh, by a friend of mine, my colleague, Katerina Yakovlenko, the curator, writer, and the, the chief editor of the cultural section in uh, Suspilne Media, in Ukrainian um, um, digital media. Her apartment, uh, in this, uh, her apartment was destroyed also in the first days of war. She was not there, she located herself, but her apartment, uh, which she didn't rent it, but she owned, and you know, it like meant a lot for a young person who finally, you know, kind of <laughs> bought her an apartment and made a renovation, and then suddenly it all was burnt and destroyed. And this is actual photos from, from yeah, um, only the heat proof pot stayed safe because it is heat proof, and yeah, the fire didn't uh, destroy it, ironically. But what she did uh, when, she, uh, when she kind of um, secured the space, when some construction workers came and kind of protected the roof, just making sure that 
nothing else will crack down and it is it can be you know safe as it is she invited artists and made a apartment exhibition or kind of what was left from apartment, you know, if we can call it this way. And I think for her, it was um, a very also um, kind of healing act, you know, to, to bring back life, to bring back um, artistic expression to her own place. Um, but also it was a very um, interesting gesture. I think it was actually one of the first exhibitions that were opened in Ukraine in general after the full-scale invasion, because um, of course, all the museums and the galleries uh, stayed closed for a while, and no one was, you know, many people left, and those who didn't didn't leave big cities, they were, you know, didn't work in these galleries and museums. They were volunteering, fighting, or doing some social services. And then I think it was one of the first exhibitions which kind of also kind of showed the green light that, yeah, the cultural life must go on. We still need to exhibit, we still need to meet, at exhibitions, discard, discuss art, produce art, because this is what you know makes our everyday life meaningful. So I think this was a very inspiring and meaningful gesture. And the other case is the exhibition which was opened exactly a year after this this one. And in between, there were of course many other exhibitions. But I would show the other contrast example. Uh, this was a huge, huge exhibition of more than 100 artworks exhibited in the so-called Ukrainian house, a huge exhibition hall in the center of Kiev, like six floors, I don't know how many thousand square meters. And it was the exhibition solely dedicated to wartime art in Ukraine. So uh, eight curators exhibited, uh, selected artworks, um, again, of artists from different backgrounds, not only famous ones, but also those who emerged only during the wartime. And they exhibited them uh, to show this, yeah, this kind of, to share this, to show, to show, to share this, uh, um, um, yeah, kind of artistic reflection that united all the Ukrainians who kind of, you know, summarized the experience of people who were living in Ukraine, reflected in the artworks. And this is a very celebrated exhibition, like a first lady attended, the Minister of Culture attended, and uh, I must say, uh, like a footnote, that in Ukraine, the contemporary art is generally not doesn't have that much state support. It's still quite a marginal field, I would say. There is no museum of contemporary art, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it's interesting how actually during the wartime, contemporary art gained so much attention by the state. Maybe not financial, financial support because most of the financial support goes to army and we can discuss if it's bad or good, but this is a separate discussion. But actually it, it kind of, uh, contemporary art gained state recognition, at least media recognition, at least, uh, you know, some kind of patronage, which I found also quite important. And um, my colleagues were referring to a very uh, popular phrase among Ukrainians, the yak or how are you, the phrase, uh, uh, um, um, this is how Ukrainians greet one another as a sign of, of empathy, as a sign of kind of mutual care. And this is exactly the title of this, of this exhibition. This exhibition was called How Are You? Yeah, and this was the very kind of, you know, right word to summarize this this experience. Um, yes. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I hope it, it was a little longer than I expected, but I hope I added something on top of, of what <laughs> what was said already. Maybe, yeah. Savita, we can open yes, the sure, discussion. Yes, sure, 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 yes, sure, yeah, 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 sure. And then okay. I can maybe yeah, just add a couple of my own, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. This has offered us really a huge <laughs> an overview, such a rich overview to start mm -hmm. discussing in a more interactive way. And thank you very much, Victor, for bringing around the uh, micro. So who would like to start? I was just wondering, have you put any thought into how art utilizing other technologies like augmented or virtual reality will have an impact on how we understand war and conflict? Mm -hmm. um, if you don't mind, I can give a brief comment about VR. Uh, um, I don't know any project based on VR technologies to uh, to pre pre present artistic understandings or, or representations of the war, but there are a lot of uh, uh, 
initiatives based on documentary projects uh, that are now uh, being implemented in Ukraine. For example, uh, there is a VR museum of war that is available online in different languages. There are also several uh, VR documentaries that were uh, um, produced in 2023. And actually, this has really changed the perception of the war because it uh, gives you the immersive experience. You can live really feel the war and live the war and have this experience uh, of being there. Uh, I understand that if we talk about art, um, it gives you some sense, uh, em emotional perception, but it, it doesn't give you this uh, re really physiological experience of living the war and this what can uh, VR technologies give. And we have several initiatives uh, in Ukraine uh, uh, focused on these experiences to bring closer uh, uh, the reality of Ukrainians to others. Yeah, but maybe some other people can also give comments about this. Uh, yeah, I also would like to commend that I, I do think that this is the uh, not only talking about VR or other technologies, but talking about digital culture and def the digital technologies in general. I do think that this is this participatory culture that is changing. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Well, yeah, this is this participatory culture that is changing our perception because not only can um, people witness and document the war firsthand, but also those who can, when uh, anything goes viral and that spreads very quickly on digital media on various types, we mean Twitter, we mean across Facebook and uh, Instagram and uh, other platforms that gives you some some feeling of presence that you get the first hand experience something that probably was not happening in previous conflicts and previous wars so i think this is the participatory culture of digital media in general that is changing the warfare turning it more into a digital warfare mm -hmm. thank you uh, lisa would you yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. I think also the interesting, the interesting moment is actually that this um, digital images and these digital artworks they uh, simultaneously because they are yeah, they, they they are kind of they can be accessible from any part of the world where there is internet. You know, Ukraine as much as any other country. Um, I think it's interesting that they this this corpus of images basically addresses two audiences simultaneously, and these two audiences perceive these images quite quite different. So, from one hand, they serve like sort of diplomatic mission of spreading insights about the war in a very accessible manner through everyday channels. Basically, what um, about my colleague was talking? Yeah, that this is a very kind of uh, first-hand uh, information uh, that anyone can can access. But at the same time, they address the very protagonists of these artworks. The Basically, they address the people who are depicted in this in these images in these artworks. And in this slide, these works offer a kind of dramatically different communication approach if to compare to Soviet Russian propaganda, because um, social media, of course, and digital me digital media are very extensively used by Russian propaganda to basically in, they they were they have been used for a long time. And in this light, kind of Ukraine has lost the digital war before the actual full-scale invasion started because the extent to which Russian propaganda uh, instrumentalized social media and this famous uh, farm, uh, um, bot farms and uh, um, all these kind of things. So I think yeah, the Russian propaganda kind of occupied the digital, digital, digital world quite extensively. But what is happening now, I think, is that the, this viral um, uh, um, user-produced uh, content made by Ukrainian artists offers something something different. Uh, it's not the propaganda in the in this kind of Soviet sense, um, where the image uh, of the of propaganda is a purely uh, artificial. Like a good example here would be the famous uh, unknown soldier, which was used in the Soviet propaganda after the World War II, where the soldier was commemorated in numerous uh, monuments and images, but it was unknown soldier. It was basically no man. It represented everyone, but actually represented no one. But what is Ukrainian digital art, viral digital art makes, is that it actually presents everyone. I mean, everyone in Ukraine, whether it is a soldier, a volunteer, a mother who had to flee the country with a child, 
or someone who stayed in Ukraine and just, I don't know, like volunteer in the, in the hospitals. Everyone can recognize themselves in these images. And therefore, I think this Ukrainian viral visual culture presents a very effective and interesting from artistic and um, a point of view and sociological point of view, a very effective alternative to Russian propaganda on how actually the digital, digital world, digital media can be used in a more honest way, but at the same time in a more effective way, because the audience, international audience, who is not that stupid anymore, you know, who can recognize, more and more can recognize, you know, fake from, from the, uh, from, from truth, this audience can maybe be much more grateful, much more open to this sort of um, like uh, user-generated content rather than to artificial images that the Russian propaganda um, offer. Mm -hmm. If yeah, if I put it clearly, yeah. clear enough. Thank you. Actually, I would like to add to this or mm -hmm. continue maybe mm -hmm. uh, uh, your thought about this production of a collective identity and its relationship between like top-down or bottom-up production. Mm -hmm. And you were mentioning the unknown soldier as an example of top-down production of a collective identity while the circulating narratives produced by media users uh, where you do not understand whether um, there is an artist, a collective of artists, or just n normal people who take part mm -hmm. in this discussion um, tell us that you know, this, this, I, this collective identity is much more um, the result of bottom-up uh, social um, um, dynamics. And yet I would like to ask what relationships there is between this, let's say, uh, bottom-up uh, collective identity and institutional narratives about the war, about collectivities, which are... I don't know, maybe at the intersection between um, top-down and mm -hmm. bottom-up processes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we know that, for example, the Ukrainian president has been very able to communicate via social media and in general um, via media. Um, so uh, what is this relationship? Have you identified like um, rupture continuities? Is um, this part of an institutional discourse uh, or is it something completely different? Mm -hmm. And again, the question is for all of you. I don't know who would like to um, reply. Maybe you start. Elizabeth. I can, yeah, mm -hmm. I can, I can start. Um, just yeah, um, feel the responsibility to start because I'm here. You know, <laughs> just like <laughs> quicker. Um, no, I think actually that um, uh, what is interesting about this uh, this digital art or just more general this like social media representation of, of art is that it's quite independent. It's it's really grassroots creativity which doesn't reflect or rely upon any like official statements or official channels or official imagery and i think the the the, the more the, the 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 further the war goes the more this crack between official channels like for example this um uh, so-called national marathon uh, on the television it's like a non-stop um, like studio where all the tv channels in ukraine kind of participate and it's like 24 7 reportage about the the war, the general life in the country, and the the more it goes, the more I think the general o general audience kind of disbelieves it. And, but on the contrary, the social media and creative reflections of the artists, the digital cre digital creators, gain more trust um, than like official channels. Again, I don't want to sound like you know unpatriotic and say that yeah the governments just like like lie or something like this. Not at all. What I want to say is that this old media, like television, for example, really lost this this you know war for me. Oh, I'm sorry for using this as battle. I don't know <laughs> competition for 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 the attention and for the trust of the audience. And in this case, what President Zelensky does is very smart because he also, of course, engages the the social media and he always you know kind of. Um, proposed this, this uh, like uh, first person speech. He, I mean, he's a professional actor, of course, and, but still he kind of, while he says, you know, people believe him because he's really speaking from, not from the, you know, he doesn't read the paper, he kind of, he speaks, you know, emotionally sometimes. So I would say that this kind of official 
official um, uh, communication and this grassroots artistic communication goes in parallel. They don't, you know, they don't kind of interfere much, but sometimes they do interfere. And for example, the, the funny and nice example of it, the first came to my mind is that, uh, especially maybe during the first, uh, first year of war, some of the kind of um, officials um, of, um, from the government's mail, uh, like uh, the Zelensky himself, like the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Kuleba, like uh, the head of the Nikolaev uh, uh, administration, uh, Vitaly Kim, who was and still is very famous for like endless bravery for defending this vulnerable part of Ukraine and not actually not uh, giving it up to Russians. Um, they were all they all became I think heroes also of this creative creative um, content being kind of praised as this like sexy heroes, like the new kind of new, I don't know, new crushes of, of the female audience, which is a bit, you know, cheesy in a way, of course, you know, when we say, ah, oh, yeah, look at him, he's just our defender, like, uh, but this is also, I think, um, it's, it's, it's fun and cheesy from one, from one point of view, but from another, it's also nice how basically this digital creative content kind of Mm, like pulls the blanket, you know, kind of makes this um, official officials, their faces, their statements, make them more relaxed and make them more accessible to the wider audience. And in this case, I think this is also this sort of soft propaganda, like playful propaganda, when, you know, when officials really responsible for defending the country, people who are actually protecting all of us, you know, in Ukraine, they suddenly become not just the talking heads from the television, but, you know, very kind of uh, accessible heroes whom, who you can, you know, just, I don't know, make a, a playful comment about or something like this. And in this way, I think it's an interesting, you know, way of, of interfering. But other than that, I think what is important that I will repeat, yeah, that this digital content, content artistic content states quite independent and quite, you know, free of any, you know, propagandistic, um, maybe, um, influences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. But definitely also the boundary between the art uh, uh, understood as a, uh, individual creativity mm -hmm. and art understood as collective discourse, collective mm -hmm. practice um, blurs. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and the, the field in the art yeah. scene is much more democratized yeah. Yeah, because mm -hmm. you don't, again, you don't need to, to be seen, you don't need to have access uh, to, to museums, to exhibition space. I mean, one can say that, of course, before the war or in the country where there is no war, artists also have access to Instagram. Anyone can post an image and become visible. But uh, I think what is important is that there is a shared topic. There is a topic which is interesting and which anyone can relate to, you know, because one can say, I'm not interested in art. I don't want to subscribe to artists. I don't want to go to museums. But then the topic of war and this experience of everyday living in the war country, you know, makes the art a very kind of common thing. Mm. Yeah. I think there was a hand raised. Did you? Ah, okay. Here, yeah, may, I, may I jump in to give an, um, one more comment to the previous uh, question? Uh, yes, sure. Okay, then uh, your comment and then the question. Right, you can keep the mic. Yeah. We just listen. Um, yeah, um, it's uh, also very interesting to see how uh, digital art is used by uh, political actors in Russia and Ukraine. And um, uh, I wouldn't agree that these two spheres uh, do not interfere, do not interact. Uh, they are really, uh, in so to some extent, uh, interconnected and very strongly. For example, um, uh, if we analyze uh, uh, official accounts of uh, uh, Twitter uh, pages of M Russian embassy, we will see that a lot of cartoons and a lot of memes are shared there to construct the meta-narrative of the war. Uh, the um, uh, image of Russia as a great power uh, um, who resists uh, colonizing uh, imperial West. And the same, we, we see a lot of examples of use of cartoons and memes and uh, artworks in political communication with the uh, um, internal and external uh, audience in Ukrainian media. For example, uh, we can see how uh, Ministry of Defense or uh, different official pa uh, pages uh, uh, use uh, memes to convey messages. So I think it's really, now it's important to say uh, that 
art is really a tool of political communication and constructing political meta narratives. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, and Alina. I, I would also just like to add just one thing that uh, this also this grassroots uh, narratives they are also conveyed higher uh, in terms of uh, sometimes these illustrations they are basically the. Uh, you know, I, I authors sometimes state uh, on Instagram that, for example, my illustration was used for that or this newspaper, right? That is why, so this is a circulating of the same narratives and so, same media, both, you know, grassroots. So this is just a much more influence of this grassroots narratives, which go top than, you know, mm -hmm. vice versa, then not only vice versa. Thank you. Yes, we have a question here. Okay. Um, I used to be vice president of ABC television, and when we tried to create new programs, we always used a battery of uh, behavioral scientists to see what programs would be appealing, what messages they would uh, send, and who the demographic was, all that kind of thing. So you've been mostly talking about Ukrainian war, 1.0, or maybe it's 2.0 now, and also spe special military operation uh, 1 or 2 or 3.0. Uh, and I want to talk about uh, going further from where we are today. So the images that you talked about so well today were images of something that happened a couple years ago. And I think that for a while they were very effective in winning hearts and minds. But now we're in a different situation where people uh, in the West, let's say, are fatigued. So my question and my thought is, instead of artists focusing on what's going on in Ukraine, maybe to take the C.S. Lewis approach that it can't happen here, to try to persuade people in the West, whether it's in my country, the U.S., or here in Austria, or uh, wherever, that if the war isn't uh, supported, uh, defended against Russia, that it could happen here, it could happen in Vienna, it could happen in Washington, it could happen in Brussels, where, wherever. And so do artists ever get together to talk about this kind of thing, about strategy? Do they get together with behavioral scientists uh, and so on to try to think about what's going to work, what's going to win hearts and minds, because today we're supposed to be talking not only about art, but about diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And so that's my question and that's my thought, and I thank you for a wonderful presentation. It was really enlightening. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment and for your question. And I think that's a very, uh, good comment that is something that we have been talking about also with my colleagues that uh, in our presentation and the article that we have published also we have focused on the first three months because this has been one of the most powerful um powerful convey of all of the emotions that everyone had and uh, this is something that i think united a lot of people and at the same time if we look at uh, the works that the artists produce right now we will see that it is changing in a way, but at the same time, a lot of those artists are still there and they continue uh, their works that they're doing because uh, a lot of them understand that it is very important to keep on producing the images and to make sure that the world continues to hear. And you have mentioned a very good point that it is uh, very important to, well, in a way, like try to take it closer to the um, European audience, to the American audience, so that they can feel it. And I think in a way, this is something that a lot of the artists are also doing right now. And this is one of the narratives that is there in the Ukrainian society right now. A lot of people are trying to show both with the artwork, with the different presentations and so on, to persuade the people to try to understand how it would be if they would be in this place. And a lot of the digital art that is appearing right now, uh, they are trying also to stress the point uh, that um, it can go further. And now is the time to do something to make sure that it does not go further and it can actually be fought in a way. Yeah. Um, I would also like to add, and I, I would really like to thank you for the comment, because, yeah, indeed, I mean, we concentrated, and we definitely should admit that in our talk, we are just talking about the very first 
time of the full-scale invasion and the very first and immediate reaction in artistic reflection. What was um, current and what was like the emotional response of many artists at that time definitely is different from what it is now and i think this might be and it it is going to be probably a topic of our further research to compare uh, sort of this visual narratives and what is happening right now and whether artists are like you know uh, are uh, trying to create something thinking strategically or this is again just an immediate reaction and an artistic reflection of what they are experiencing and seeing and circulating then. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is another question. Um, maybe I just want to add to this uh, shortly that mm, in this respect, maybe we should not only think of the content or of the media itself, but also of how social media function in general. And there is something that is called economy of attention. And that's the the thing here at stake, I think. You know, it's not just what you post, what you produce as an artist, but you fight uh, for the attention. You have to find the right networks and you have to keep um, followers um, following you somehow. And I think that's the, the, the challenge, you know, that, that the, the ability that goes beyond, actually, uh, whether you are able or not to produce good art. Um, yeah, so I think uh, this is also a matter of networks and, and this ability to um, strengthen them. But there is another question here from the audience, please. Thanks a lot. My name is Gunther Fellinger. I'm a Twitter activist for Ukraine. I have mm -hmm. 75,000 followers actually, and I developed a profile very actively, especially for NATO membership of Ukraine and the institutional question for arms for Ukraine, for Austria to supply mm -hmm. tanks and our military support, which was not very successful, unfortunately. So I want to give a reflective remark uh, on that one, because now two years in the war, we have really tried everything to win the Austrian public, the European public, the American public, and we have been, of course, in the beginning very successful. But now there is a little bit of a moment where we are no longer so effective. Mm -hmm. And the Russian counter-propaganda is effective in America very much, in some countries. And in Austria, it was always very effective. Yeah? We have never broken into the mainstream media in Austria. We were defeated by the Kronen Zeitung, by the OAF, and they have all brought their, I don't say the Russian propaganda, but a very mixed uh, level of messages uh, all the time. <laughs> and mm -hmm. we have never really achieved so much. So my question is, don't, you know, arts is very important, and I appreciate everything that is done and wonderfully presented, but don't we have to be much more effective in the third war of year? Uh, don't we have to be more brutal, more open, showing more of the bloodshed, not using art, art methods uh, to soften it up a bit, but showing the brutality of the war much more clearer, the victims, yeah? and somehow, if I say so, also going into a propaganda modus. <laughs> we have to win this war, we have to win this battle. <laughs> it's not about art anymore, it's really about victory. And uh, that's my question, uh, how can we intensify and be more successful in the next year, hopefully leading to victory? Thanks a lot. That's a big question. I'm glad that I am not yeah. a speaker. <laughs> to, but yeah, and, and thank you very much, first of all, for all the efforts that you are doing for, uh, for Ukraine and for Ukrainian cause. And unfortunately, I think it's a question that we cannot answer. Uh, we the only thing we can do um, uh, from our side, do small steps, help uh, who we can support um, uh, our friends on the front lines, um, support volunteers. Uh, and um, yes, uh, war is very violent, war is very brutal, but um, um, I think that now, with the war fatigue accumulated and uh, mm, the fact that people get used to the war in Ukraine, um, it, it's not the best pervasive uh, tool uh, to demonstrate the atrocities of the war. Um, and sometimes the creativity, uh, artistic creativity, make, can make more an open uh, demonstration of the devastative effects of the war because it it help it really helps to collect funds it really helps to uh, 
make people think about Ukraine? Um, unfortunately, I don't have answer to your uh, question. What else can we do? Uh, mm, mm, try to talk to more people, try to persuade them to help Ukraine. Uh, try to fight Russian propaganda, uh, speak more with others, try to convey uh, uh, the truth about Ukraine. But um, what else? Maybe my colleagues or well, Elisaveta has the answer. I don't know. If I may jump in with a short comment also, I completely agree with everything that Alina has said. And in a way, I think this is also related uh, to what Julia has been talking before. Uh, that uh, the artists have to win an audience, but it's not always, it doesn't always go only to that. They also have to fight against the AI algorithms and they have to fight against the Instagram algorithms because very often when the artists were showing the brutality of the wars, all the violence, a lot of the artwork was suspended from Instagram and uh, um, they, uh, their accounts would be banned, and this is also one of the topics that they showed then later on in their Instagram post. And the artists tried to change from different media from one to another. They tried to use different tricks in order to go around this. And in a way, I think also trying to be creative and trying to use somewhere sarcasm, somewhere humor, somewhere trying to show the different sides of it. This is also a way to spread the word about what is going on but at the same time trying to be, uh, well, if I may say politically correct and something that will let you actually stay online and stay visible. Uh, and again, uh, I completely agree with Elena that uh, I think the things that we can do is continue to talk about it, continue to tell about it. And I think now is also the time when the story is not of the government, not of the um, officials are the ones that will help so much but this is the story of the people that talk to other people and tell their stories show their pictures because this is something when people want to see the real story not just something on the internet and in the digital world yeah um and um i would also like to add a comment about even the images of violence and atrocities that are there on the digital media they are sometimes and i totally agree here with adina they are sometimes they create uh the a certain apathy that that they really also lead to certain fatigue right i mean i was thinking about this book by susan zontag about regarding the pain of others which actually that book's also that book also demonstrate that on the one hand uh certain like violent images they although they are aimed to show that war is the highest evil and it should be avoided at any cost it actually leads to a different thing right it leads to the ap uh, apathy and to the lack of sympathy so the thing is here it's not about like showing or demonstrating the violence or atrocities this is about and uh, here i would probably return the question to the audience right because what ca what else can diplomacy do in that sense because what artists do they attract the attention right they demonstrate what ukrainians do ukrainians talk about that and and show that indeed i mean this work can spread and go further but until it's there i mean people still would be you know inattentive and will just lose sympathy to what is happening in ukraine until that doesn't touch them personally and this is then yeah what else can we do mm -hmm. I have a just brief comment. No, also, thank you so much for what you're doing. I think, you know, because of people like you and your activities, also the support still exists, maybe less than Ukraine would expect, but still. Now, I want to add, I mentioned it briefly before, but I want to emphasize it once again, that I think, of course, the, the artworks, the digital art and social media cannot, you know, um, change the minds of the, you know, politicians on, in uh, EU or US, you know, to give more support, to give weapons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think what is important to, to remember that this art also serves for the internal audience in Ukraine. I think what it does is that it keeps the spirit high. It kind of brings back the dignity to the people in Ukraine and basically also 
um, make their life a little bit more, you know, meaningful, even to that extent, I can say, because um, uh, it is very important to remember that, of course, I mean, it's obvious that Ukraine would not, will never win this war without the support of the uh, international partners, without the su weapon supplies and economical support and, and everything, but it can also, it cannot also win the war if the people will not go to, to volunteer to go to the army, if they will not pay taxes, keep the economy alive, and donate, and volunteer, and all this kind of stuff. And I think that in this case, the, the artists and the digital creators also make a huge um, impact on this, on keeping this spirit of these people inside of the country, you know, high and kind of cheering them up i don't know to you know i don't want to make it banal that the art needs to cheer someone up but it keeps it keeps the spirit it keeps this meaning and what i was when i, when I was showing my, my my like examples of the fundraising campaigns created by artists i think it is an important example because no one in ukraine even will donate any money and will not support anything if there will be only photographs of the wounded soldiers or something like that because I mean, the wounded soldiers, I'm sorry to say, are all around. You can see them on the streets, you know. It's, um, but then when the, you know, the artists kind of invent something more creative, playful, unexpected, and even funny, you know, when they kind of mock up on the topic of war, they immediately shift the focus on people, on, on, of their audience, and, you know, people kind of just donate because they find something interesting, something different. And they, also, these artists, they raise... Such big, sums of mo such big sums of money they have never seen in their lives. They would never sell any of their artworks uh, before the war for, the, for this money. And they also kind of reinvent themselves in this role. So I think um, maybe the art cannot change the minds of the politicians and would not you know, make the international support like um, can, kind of double it or triple it, but it can definitely help the um, kind of... It, brings back the pride and self-confidence and self-dignity to the, to the people who are still physically fighting this war day to day. I think in this case, the art is very important and the artist has to you know, keep going and <laughs> keep producing content and yeah, serving this purpose. Yeah, I would like to add another perspective on this, um, namely uh, the, uh, um, the level of transnational communication and the fact that, um, I mean, first of all, uh, this war was supposed to be very brief in the intentions of um, Russia. So if we are still debating about this, even if it's not over, it still lasted much longer than it was expected. And uh, this is also thanks to the engagement of so many different people, not only the soldiers, not only the military, but also people like you, people uh, like the artists you have spoken, like mm. yourself. And, um, and I think this all makes um, the, the, the power of a society, which is not just the power of the military. And to uh, go back to the issue of diplomacy and um, um, the fact that Russia has been powerful in influencing public opinion in uh, many countries is not related to the fact that they have shown or hidden um, a specific, um, a specific images or, or they have displayed narratives, but that they have managed to transculturalize their message to the extent that they managed to um, interfere with very local national debates that have nothing to do with the war, but to get into these networks, into the racist discourse, for example, into the discourse of exclusion, into the discourse of constructing a particular image of a leader which influence elections in many countries. So this is a very subtle way of transmitting a message without speaking at all about the war. Um, actually, not mentioning the war at all. So I think that maybe if we think of strategies, we should reverse the question and, and think about how can we transculturalize this message to create alliances um, by interfering in other discussions that are more local, more regional, national, transnational, and maybe are not related directly to the war. Of course, there is also 
the war and the military aspect of this. But I think that this is like the more cultural aspect and there is a certain power in it, I believe, at least. Anyway, I, I don't want to leave you tonight with this pessimistic <laughs> mood, so I, I, let's uh, have a look also at possible uh, scenarios of, you know, contributing to positive developments. Uh, um, would you like to reply or because you are... I appreciate you know all these artists and you know, all the major contributions, yeah. But the problem is still one of the strategy and how to use many things. For example, one thing which was used too much against you is that there are no presidential elections and there is a lot of media control in Ukraine mm -hmm. at the moment. Yeah, these are major issues which have to be addressed. Yeah? Now today, for example, is uh, tonight is the president's address. Or in the, the State of the Union address. I'll give you another example uh, where the tactics and the strategy of Ukraine is not really perfect. Yeah? Now the wife of Zelensky has rejected to be invited uh, to the US Congress State of the Union because she didn't want to sit next to the video. You know, these are all decisions yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. which out of the Ukrainian context are maybe understandable. Uh, which makes my work <laughs> on mm. Twitter, I'm just a very small uh, activist, yeah, but it makes the whole case a little mm. bit less defendable and it's not so good. Yeah? And we yeah. also have not managed, here also my appeal to the uh, Ukrainian activists, you know, the, to really um, degrade <laughs> the Russian capacity <laughs> to dominate the media space in the West. Uh, and this is uh, where we have also, I think, uh, significantly failed. That's a bit my comment yeah. on that one. And my encouragement, we will definitely win this war. There's no doubt. The Western democracies always win. But it would be good if it's a bit faster. <laughs> I think that would be good. That was all I had to say. Sorry. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um, well, um, I think we are running out of time. Yes, definitely. So let me um, thank everybody. Let me thank you, our speakers, Ola, Alina, Svitlana, and Julia. Thank you so much for sharing your research with us. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing your insights and your experience. And thank you, everybody, our audience, for, for participating, for your attention, your questions. Um, yeah, thank you, and have a good rest of the evening. Yeah, and we thank want you to say, um, say thank you, everyone, yeah, organizers and uh, our discutant and all audience. And today uh, we did um, together a small step uh, to support Ukraine and to share information again and again about the brutal Russian war in Ukraine. Uh, thank you.